Thanks for sticking around this long. And uh, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the fact that I'm probably the last thing between you and a beer. Uh, and I take this responsibility very seriously. So um, with no further ado, let's get going. Uh, we're going to be taking on a little bit of a deeper dive into the storage working group in the CNCF today, um, give you an idea of uh, particularly a white paper that we've been writing, uh, Alex, myself, and uh, several others, some of whom are in the room have tried to uh, put together some information that we hope will be useful to uh, consumers of cloud native storage to kind of standardize and help everyone use the same language when discussing this stuff and get a sort of a higher level overview which will hopefully help you categorize the different uh, the, the myriad of different storage options that seem to be available today um, uh, we'll have a q a session at the end and between alex and i we're going to kind of take you through the material that we have here today. Feel free to interrupt along the way if there are any urgent questions or comments that you think can't wait till the Q&A section at the end. I don't mind people interrupting. And with no further ado. <clears throat> so what we tried to do uh, is a combination of things. As I said, the, the overall aim was to educate people and, and provide a common platform of language for people to have conversations about what the most appropriate forms of storage are for various different uh, use cases in the cloud native environment. Um, we tried to define the attributes of storage systems and particularly as they pertain to cloud native storage, uh, which in many cases is distributed and that adds various interesting properties and attributes. Uh, we also tried to give you know, clearer definitions of the different layers um, that constitute storage systems. So many of you might be familiar with the fact that you obviously have a data access interface. So you, you, know, you need to be able to read and write the data, but you typically also need to be able to provision volumes, uh, back them up. And then in many cases, you also need other forms of, uh, of APIs, which are things for like managing uh, distributed storage systems. In many cases, the actual uh, operations of, of some of these big distributed storage systems are big enough that you need a whole other system to manage them for you. Um, so just understanding wh where the interfaces between those pieces are and, uh, and what the vocabulary around them is, uh, we decided was a useful thing to uh, agree upon. Um, then again, you know, within any one of those sets of interfaces, you have a variety of different options available. Uh, so volumes are one example, but there are many other ways that you can access storage, and we'll have a look at those, um, and, and the various different interfaces for managing things. Uh, these are the people who were the primary authors uh, of the document. Uh, you might recognize some of the names there. In fact, we're fairly proud of the fact that we got some pretty serious experts involved here. Um, you know, if, if you want to describe a key value stores, there are not a lot of better people in the world than the author of etcd to tell you what a key value store is. So there's one example. Uh, I think we did fairly well at, at getting you know, pretty knowledgeable people to distill the vast amount of information that's out there into, into something so hopefully useful. Um, so as I mentioned, there, there are very different, uh, many different layers, interfaces, uh, et cetera, in, in, a, in a complete storage system. Rather than you know, focus too much on the, the architecture initially, I think what's, what's perhaps a better starting point is to understand what the attributes of a storage system are. And in particular, those are the things that you usually need to match to your application. Um, so if your application needs you know, strong consistency, then you need to go and look for strongly consistent systems, and then the rest of the solution kind of falls out of that, rather than the other way around. Rather than say, I want to use uh, you know, system XYZ because everybody says it's cool, uh, and then try and force my application to use that thing, which may not actually be the right match, or vice versa. Um, so we, we identified what we thought were a very useful set of attributes. There are more than this, but, but we focused on what we thought were the most important ones. Um, availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Now, these are all you know, fairly short words. Uh, I think most people think they understand what all of them mean. Turns out some of them are more complex that, than, than one might otherwise um, believe. And uh, I won't reuse, I'm sure some of you have, were in the intro uh, section this morning and, and perhaps in the storage uh, uh, day on Monday, so I won't 
belabor my consistency example, but I think it's fairly commonly understood that the C in you know, cap and the C in acid are not actually the same kind of consistency. They're different kinds of consistency. And the same goes for durability uh, and performance. There are various different flavors of performance and scalability. So we dived into that in quite a bit of detail in the, in the white paper just to you know, try and tear these, these terms apart and make sure that we're all talking about the same thing when we use these words. Um, there are actually a few other attributes that are pretty important as well in the real world, perhaps less technical. Um, the one is, is the operational complexity of, of whatever the solution is that you choose. Um, in some cases, this can be as simple as a, as a managed service that you subscribe to in a public cloud provider, in which case you, for the most part, have nothing to do. Um, and on the other extreme, the, the, there could be you know, open source software that you need to uh, download, install, figure out all the bugs in, uh, deploy on your production environment, and then in many cases write additional software to actually make that stuff work properly. Uh, and there's a whole spectrum of, of uh, difficulty in, in that, depending on which options you, you decide to take. Um, the other obvious one, uh, which is perhaps one of the things that, that sort of triggered cloud native in the first place, is cost. So, um, you know, right from the beginning, and I was sort of the, there right from the beginning of EC2, which one might argue was the beginning of cloud computing as we know it today, um, the primary driver was actually cost. Uh, there, there are many other factors that, that came into it, convenience, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, if you, if you have to, if, if you can just get as much compute and storage capacity as you want immediately and pay for it only during the minutes that you need it, uh, everybody ten, turns out to be much happier uh, than if you have to spend months you know, pre-ordering stuff and planning. And I'm sure you're all intimately familiar with the, uh, the arguments behind why cloud computing has been successful. Uh, but a lot of it is cost. <clears throat> so we shouldn't forget about that either. Um, I'm not going to go into too much more detail on this slide, but just to say that in achieving some of these uh, fundamental properties or attributes, uh, we often you know, come across a lot of other terms. So how does, avail how does failover work? Uh, how does redundancy work? How does data protection work? These are not really attributes. These are more features of the system that are used to achieve some of these uh, attributes, which is what we're often after. <clears throat> um, this, this slide is a little bit mixed up in that it has a combination of these tools as well as some you know, breakdown of some of the properties. So, when we think about scalability, it's important to realize that there, there are various different axes of scalability. So you might want to uh, understand how much data you can actually store in a system. Like, how big does it get before it becomes unusable? Uh, and that may be very important for you. If you have enormous amounts of data to store, uh, you should make sure that whatever solution you choose can, can accommodate that data. And if, you get the, if your estimates are wrong, um, then you, know, you should know whether you have any way out of that. Uh, and often people talk about horizontal scalability versus vertical scalability, et cetera. Uh, do you want to scale the number of clients that can access it, which is a completely different axis of scalability, and you should never confuse the two. Uh, do, you want to, do you want to scale the performance of the thing? Do you want to be able to do more IOPS, et cetera? And, and if, you need, if your number of customers grows or your number of users of your application grows, uh, is there a ceiling uh, to how fast you can read and write to this data store? And, and if not, or if there is, what, what avenues do you have out of it? Can you scale up, uh, or are you stuck and you need to go and buy bigger boxes, et cetera? Um, and there's some overlap between scalability and performance, et cetera. <clears throat> Consistency, as I mentioned, is, is probably one of the more interesting uh, attributes in, uh, in the sense that I think in the early days, people were mostly familiar with fairly consistent stores, uh, be those databases, uh, local file systems, even remote file systems and block stores. They were, for the most part, uh, highly consistent and fairly, fairly performant. Um, but they, they ran into you know, issues related to scalability and, 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 um, and availability, for the most part. You know, if you have one box in the corner and it falls over, you're not available. Um, and if you have one box in the corner and you suddenly have a million users uh, or vast amounts of transactions that need to be done, uh, they tend to reach their limits. And if your only option is to put a bigger box in the corner, uh, you start looking for other options. So that's where uh, big distributed systems started becoming more popular. Uh, things like EBS and S3 and, and alternative ways of storing things. Um, 
And this led to you know, implicit consistency challenges, which, unless you understand them clearly, uh, can cause your applications to get very complicated and not work, to be perfectly blunt. So uh, that's, that's an area that we kind of dived into in quite a bit of detail. And uh, yeah, hopefully that's useful. Uh, in terms of durability, uh, this is perhaps a, a good place to sort of uh, take a little diversion. So, one thing we made a, a point of doing in the paper, in the description, was not to confuse access interfaces with the actual attributes of the storage. So a, a good example might be object stores. So I'm sure many of you have come across object stores. Um, they tend to have HTTP interfaces. They tend to you know, support operations like put and get at fairly granular levels to be designed for big pieces of data like images or videos or backups or whatever. Um, but you know, S3, I guess, was the grandparent of, of many of these object stores. Uh, Dropbox came out of that and various other things after that. Um, but S3 provides you know, more than just an interface definition. It provides a whole bunch of guarantees around durability uh, and implicit uh, performance uh, implications of some of those durability guarantees. So I'm not sure what the architecture actually is these days, but certainly back in the day, it was three copies um, in different uh, availability zones, different data centers, essentially. Um, and basically, your data would never disappear. That, that was kind of part of the, the value offering of S3. And I think today, still, there's uh, advertisements of like 11.9's durability or something like that, that your data will basically never go away. Um, but there's a cost to that. There's a cost in terms of performance. There's a cost in terms of the redundancy that you have to have. Um, and so uh, uh, some people have actually built things that have exactly the same interface. They have precisely the S3 interface, but they don't have all of those durability guarantees, and they don't put your data in multiple data centers, et cetera. So just you know, make sure that when you talk about an object store, you're talking about the one that copies your data into lots of different locations and gives you 11.9's durability, or you're talking about the one that actually stores it on a file somewhere in the file server uh, and doesn't give you any of those guarantees. <coughs> Uh, as I mentioned, in addition to the sort of primary properties, it's pretty important to understand the uh, instantiation and deployment aspects of whatever storage system it is that you choose. Uh, and you know, I, I think most of this is fairly familiar to people, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But some of them are, are tend to be more hardware focused. So you have, you know, typically smaller amounts, smaller numbers of more dedicated hardware, and you tie a few of them together. Uh, with fairly consistent state, uh, often with proprietary hardware, interconnects, uh, networks, et cetera. And then there's the category, which are, tend to be more software related, um, often open source projects. Um, and you can you know, deploy these yourselves, either on premise uh, or in a public cloud. And um, these tend to be more distributed. They come with a lot more management overhead because you have to uh, you know, run the software yourself in some cases. And then in other cases, you can obviously s subscribe to either um, instances of open source services or uh, proprietary uh, storage services like in many of the public clouds. And I think at this point, I'm going to hand over to my esteemed colleague, Alex, who's going to take you a little deeper into the interfaces and also the topologies of the storage systems available today. Thank you. Um, so one of the things, one of the things that, that we often define storage systems by is, is a data access interface. And, and for many years, the, the data access interface kind of defines a, a key set of properties that, 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 that people are used to expecting out of that, out of that storage. Um, when it comes to cloud native storage, we, we kind of bucketed two uh, general categories of, of storage. Um, the first one being volumes, which is, which is I guess, um, the, the more maturely orchestrated um, uh, interface in, in orchestrators like Kubernetes. And, and, and that covers things like um, block interfaces and, and file interfaces, um, as well as shared file interfaces where um, those interfaces where, where file systems can be shared by multiple hosts um, on different nodes at the same time. Um, in, in, in the general case, block interfaces, in the most simplistic fashion, start off with 
a local disk, right? So, so a disk is, is a fundamentally a block interface, and on top of a disk, you place a file system, and then that file system provides the interface which most, most applications use. Um, some types of databases can access block devices directly, but in general, people, um, the applications are accessing file systems. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have the, the, the API bucket. So, so this is um, an interface whereby the workloads are, being, are accessing the storage system typically through a network interface rather than an operating system interface. Um, and that can be uh, the most popular ones being obviously an object store, um, but also um, much more, much more uh, common nowadays are, are things like key value stores, um, but obviously all the other databases. You know, so so a database is a valid way or is a, is a valid storage medium, um, and it's 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 I guess a traditional medium for a lot of applications to to store their data. Um, this slide is a little contentious, so we, we tried to do a comparison of the different um, the different uh, volume access interfaces, um, because as I said, typically there's a kind of general expectation that different interfaces have certain properties. So very often, block interfaces, for example, um, are particularly good for uh, low latency and individual workloads on on individual hosts, for example. But perhaps they're less suited for, for sharing or, or, or scaling from a capacity point of view. File systems, on the other hand, are, are um, really good for um, sharing, or often shared, sh shared file systems give you that capability to share workloads across multiple um, nodes or applications in parallel. Um, and they are often optimized for, for throughput. Um, but, but have disadvantages around locking and consistency when, when used by um, complex transactional systems, for example. Um, and as, as uh, Quinton was mentioning, object stores often have availability and durability as one of their, uh, as one of their key aspects, assuming obviously that those, those object stores have those, cap those attributes. Um, and, they're, and they're great for sharing throughput across lots of workloads, but because of the way, but the distribution and the protocol um, implies uh, a higher level of latency, for example. Now, one of the things that we struggled with when we started putting the white paper together was that these, general, uh, these generalizations can often change quite dramatically by depending on uh, the various layers that might exist within a storage system. So most storage systems are composed of a whole variety of layers, and there might be operating system layers um, or, or, or physical um, storage components that, that, are, that dramatically affect the overall uh, attributes of, those, of that system. Um, and it's often, um, and, and often as storage systems get more complex in cloud native environments, you often have layerings of systems where perhaps um, uh, a file system actually uses an object store on a back end, for example, or, or, um, or, or perhaps a block device is layered on top of a distributed file system. So at the end of the day, the attributes of that particular storage system become a combination of the attributes at each layer in the, in the stack. So um, orchestrators and host and operating system layer, which, which kind of is, is how the application is, is consuming um, that that storage system um, can have quite an effect on on things like availability or, or scalability or even performance. So in uh, in volumes, you see um, volume managers playing playing a, uh, an aspect here, but also things like um, in container runtimes, uh, bind mounts and overlay file systems, for example. Um, and when you're accessing uh, storage systems through the network. Um, we often we often have um, a variety of layers and tools which are which are interjected as part of the system, um, perhaps load balancers, perhaps meshes, uh, discovery mechanisms. Um, a big aspect of the uh, of 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 how a storage system performs and uh, and is uh, and the availability and scalability of that system is is fundamentally going to be down to the topology of the storage system. So 
Initially, as, as, as Quentin mentioned, a lot of a lot of storage systems had a centralized kind of a, a centralized topology where you had a small number of components. They were often hardware based. They were often using um, some sort of uh, proprietary interconnect to maintain a high level of state between between the different components in the system. Um, and they provided uh, remote storage to, to, to a number of nodes where a number of nodes could connect to that centralized, to that centralized storage system. So, so this was an environment where you primarily scaled the system up. Um, and it was, um, and, it, and, then, and they were often designed for, for low latency environments. Um, but obviously they couldn't scale horizontally, they were um, complex to, to operate, and there were fundamental limitations on, on, on how far you could um, grow those type of systems. Um, moving forward, uh, along came distributed uh, topologies, and distributed topologies have uh, the capability of spreading out load on a horizontal basis, where effectively, um, oftentimes they're deployed with a shared nothing architecture, so so they can be deployed so they can be deployed as as software just running on individual commodity um, servers or nodes, um, and the and, and however, due to the complexity of of some of these distributed systems, they can be harder to operate, and perhaps that you might you might have uh, implications on latency. Um, sharded environments are uh, systems where a data set is split using um, using some sort of algorithm, perhaps a hashing algorithm or something like that, which allows you to spread the load or sp spread the, 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 the data across a number of different individual systems. Um, very often, sharding is used within databases, and, 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 this, is, and this is the most um, typical use case. But sharding also comes with, um, sharding is perhaps simpler to, to implement in some distributed systems because you have, um, say, lots of individual database nodes which, which handle um, individual uh, splits of the data. But the way you split the data can often change as the data grows. Um, and the original use cases don't often apply, so you end up having some shards which might run really hot, and then it's really complicated. It could be really complicated to redistribute that data across different nodes. Um, and then we have um, hyperconverged uh, storage. So hyperconverged storage is where compute environments and storage um, environments are effectively sharing the same compute resources. Um, this has proved this has proved to be um, quite popular in in cloud native environments, and we and we see this we see this pattern uh, growing quite quickly. Um, however, there often are again operational complexity issues here because the storage environment and the compute environment now get managed um, as a single entity. So um, changes to the compute environment affect the storage environment, and changes to the storage environment affect the compute environment. Um, another big aspect of that a storage system provides is the is the data protection. So this is this is controlling things like um, the durability, the, the availability, and uh, the the redundancy, I guess, of the data. Um, there are a lot of traditional systems like um, RAID and mirroring, where where data is is protected through a combination of of parity or or effectively copies of the data distributed across. Um, a number of disks. Um, more often nowadays, both for performance, uh, for performance reasons, um, and, and, and often for, for architectural reasons, replicas are are, distribu are used as a as a method of copying data around um, and, and ensuring that data is available in the in the event of a loss. So things like um, things like object stores and and some distributed systems use use replicas as their data protection mechanism, and as, as a method of performing, rather than as a method of performing replication as well as um, saving on capacity, um, erasure coding is another technique used for data protection. So erasure coding allows you to provide a more optimized, um, a more capacity optimized method of uh, protecting your data. So rather than having lots of copies, that data is split into, um, into a, a set of data blocks and parity blocks. 
um, and this allows you to, to recuperate the data or to recover the data if, if any node gets lost. The downside being that um, erasure coding typically implies a much higher amount of latency um, because of the compute overhead and the distributed nature of that system. Um, Storage systems will also provide, typically provide a range of data services. So things like, um, things like replication, where, where one storage system can replicate to, to another storage system is obviously the most uh, common use case. Snapshots and clones are key to um, backups and point in time copies of the data. Um, and, and more and more common, especially in uh, um, cloud services and uh, service provider environments is, is encryption, where more and more the storage providers are providing uh, an encryption capability to keep data safe um, within, within those environments. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this slide, um, but I'll just say that the physical layer obviously provides capabilities around both durability and performance, typically. So the, the, the um, starting off from spinning disk all the way to SSDs and now in VMEs, you have a, you have a scale of, of performance which generally has compromises with, with uh, durability and the lifetime of, this, of the storage. Um, probably one of the most um, uh, well-developed um, and uh, constantly developed uh, technologies at the moment is how the storage systems or, um, integrate with orchestrators through a variety of management interfaces. So we already talked about the workloads and how they access the, the data access interfaces in the data plane of a storage system. But likewise, another key aspect is how can you make your storage declarative and composable? So in, in, in much the same way as an, you can def ask an orchestrator to, um, uh, to, to run a container in a pod for you, and you can specify things like network requirements and CPU and memory requirements, you can now also ask an orchestrator to, to supply storage interfaces for you um, and supply a set of parameters that, that an orchestrator can interact with uh, a storage system with. Um, the, there are a number of different interfaces in use today. Um, the, 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 there are a number of native interfaces which are built into some orchestrators. So for example, Kubernetes has, I believe, 16 or 17 native drivers. Um, in, in, in built mainlined into the Kubernetes source. Um, we also have things like DVDI, which is a, a, a Docker runtime uh, interface to volume drivers, which, which can interface with storage systems. Um, and we also have uh, the Flex interface in Kubernetes, which I guess is the first generation of an external storage driver to Kubernetes. Um, followed rapidly on with the CSI interface, which is now the new, the new uh, de facto standard for, for container storage interfaces, allowing orchestrators to both dynamically provision and consume storage, um, as well as providing some more advanced features like, um, like snapshots and clones and things like that, which are, which are currently in development. And CSI was released um, as the 1.0 release with Kubernetes for the latest version of Kubernetes just a couple of weeks ago. Quinton, do you want to cover the next steps? No, I think you're doing much better. Mm -hmm. OK. Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the the white paper is is now released. We'll be issuing um, we'll be issuing a link after this uh, after this presentation. <laughs> going to announce it in a minute. Say again. Uh, I say have just made such a thing. I will put it up uh, during the Q and A sh session. Fantastic. Um, and uh, and what we'd really like is your feedback and your interact and and your your comments on on the white paper, anything to 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 help us make it better. Um, and we're also, as a next step, going to be looking to uh, investigate and publish um, real life case studies on um, pe people's use of different storage systems to kind of take some of these. Um, some of the terminology and some of the work that we've done in the white paper and, and, and transform that to kind of real life um, use cases and real life scenarios. Um, 
Finally, there are a, a number of other sessions that you might be interested uh, while you're at Cubicon tomorrow, um, covering some of the different technologies that we've talked about. And questions? Fire. When, what's the scope of storage in the context of Kubernetes? So, so the question was, what's the scope of storage in 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 terms of Kubernetes? I think, I think what what we're seeing now is that more and more um, different application patterns and different um, workloads that are moving to orchestrated environments have some component of uh, a stateful nature. Right at the end of the day, every architecture and every application has a has a stateful requirement. Um, whether that's uh, storing, system, storing data themselves or, or consuming data from, say, databases or perhaps message buses or instrumentation or observability systems, which require to store state somewhere. So more and more um, stateful systems are, um, are a huge dependency on making workloads, on, on, on allowing workloads to, to migrate to Kubernetes environments. And I think this is, this is a trend that will be growing over the next few years. Actually, but try again. Where does the responsibility of the storage solution end in terms of the life cycle of the data? It depends on the solution. It depends on the solution is the right answer. <laughs> so, so the question is, where, where does the, store, the role of the storage solution end in terms of the the, um, the, cycle, the data management cycle? Um, well, a storage a, a storage solution can have um, a lot of complex functionality because remember, a storage system can be a database and can have um, a variety of of uh, of functionality there, but also a storage solution can be responsible for um, taking care of things like data retention and, and, and other functionality. Um, so it does depend a lot on the storage system. Any other questions? So, so, so that's a very good question. So, so the question is, if we're doing big data and, and we're considering things like um, data locality, how, does, how is that implemented? Um, the, the answer is that uh, data locality and, and is, is something that is actually covered in some of the CSI spec. And we're looking at things where the, the topology uh, of, the, of the storage system and the topology of the compute nodes come together in, 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 a, in a schema. So, Kubernetes can query where the storage is and can help, and that can help place the pods closer to the storage for data locality reasons. Anything else? So, so other than the, the interface. So, besides the interface that uh, Kubernetes would require from a storage system, what are what is one feature that the storage system should have, is good to have in a cloud native environment that current storage systems do not have and it's a problem that they don't. <laughs> I thought we uh, disallowed difficult questions today. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to answering that well. <laughs> um, so so I think when we look at when we look at cloud native um, storage systems, there are probably a couple of key things that that, that need to happen to 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 allow it to work well with with orchestrated environments. The the, the first thing is that um, storage systems have traditionally um, presented storage to operating systems or or, or VMs, um, and now what we're looking to do is we're we're looking to present. Um, storage to applications, right? So uh, fundamentally, you've containerized the application, you've made it portable, and the orchestrator can place the application where, wherever it wants. And you need to have a system now where storage can be presented to the application and move with the application. So, so portability is, is a big thing. 
Um, the other big thing is that the whole point of having an orchestrated storage system is that it's declarative and composable. So in much the same way that you declare, say, CPU and memory and, and network ports and things like that, you should also be able to declare the storage requirements and have the orchestrator both dynamically provision and consume that storage. Um, so having those those interfaces and, and, and APIs where the orchestrator can can uh, can use a driver can hook into into a storage system to allow the storage system to do that is key. Anything else? Fire. Just to pick up on what you were talking about about the the movement to bind data to applications and the model by which storage systems can be told to do this. The white paper seems to talk about, well, it's a taxonomy of current storage systems, perhaps, and those that will be you know, forthcoming in some short horizon, but there would seem to be much further to go to get closer to a, you know, to a, a model that binds data to applications more tightly. And I wonder, what do you see, how, do, how will the CNCF, perhaps this working group, or perhaps a different one, uh, consider that question and these, you know, these concepts that need to be talked about to implement that more closely, if, if that makes sense. Do you want to take that? <laughs> um, I, I don't have a short answer for you. I, I think what we tried to focus on was fundamental topologies as opposed to um, you know these are all the systems out there and and this is what they do i mean it's kind of difficult to imagine topologies other than centralized distributed sharded uh, i mean maybe these things will arise but these are things that predated you know cloud computing by by many decades um, it is true to say that I think there are some subtleties within that, and as we mentioned earlier, there are many kinds of sharded systems and many kinds of distributed systems, um, and, and within each one of those areas, uh, there are specializations. For example, the sort of Hadoop Spark type case where you want to place the computation on the data rather than the other way around. Um, but those are still fundamentally distributed systems. To some extent, they're sharded. And yes, we need to dive into some of those areas. Big data is, is the, you know, the elephant in the room, obviously, because there's an enormous amount of data. And uh, moving it around the network and on and off disks is, is you know, fundamentally extremely expensive. So anything you can do to minimize the amount of data movement uh, is, is, is a very good thing. And yes, we, we need some, to do some more work there, for sure. It won't just be where we place it, even maybe um, you know when you time it, like that node where this data is busy, so how about delaying it and still getting done just in time or a little later, you know, like the sure. best effort burstable type of Yeah, things. I mean, in a sense, you've got the time axis and the space axis, space and you want to place it in the right place on that two-dimensional space, not, not just on the space axis, yeah, or three-dimensional space, depending on which way you look at it. <clears throat> Microphone. Sort of a persistent, highly performant storage, yeah. Being an SSD drive and VME or persistent memory. So. Maybe I misunderstood the question. It sounded like you wanted to specialize the storage to the needs of a particular application and make sure there was a close couple there. Not, not so much that, but if they're. Okay, so traditional storage systems will, as he was talking about, they serve to. They'll serve to an iSCSI initiator, for example, and they'll, there was a declaration somewhere that that initiator at that IQN can talk to this target and report LUNs will say LUN2. You can see that. Now, the question is, you know, how, what you're really doing there is tr what you're trying to accomplish is there's an application running somewhere on that host, and it could be a VM in the hypervisor, it could be just an application running on the host, no hypervisor, and you are accomplishing the delivery of data access to that application, which is there. 
it's all implied. None of that is explicit in the mapping model that you've just that you've just expressed. Same with fiber channel, and it seems still largely true. Uh, it's a little bit different, right? But you basically deliver a volume, and then there are sim links that mount it into a container. And so it's it's an evolution, but still very. It's it's an increment towards something I think that might be not there yet. I guess is what I was wondering, and, and yeah. it's an open discussion. It seems like, and, and my question was, what is this working group's role in facilitating that discussion? Or, or you know, as you said earlier today, maybe it's job done, and there's a, yeah. there's a different group to try to tackle the further discussion. Yeah, unfortunately, we're we're going to get kicked out of this room five minutes ago. So uh, what I can encourage you to do, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, this was a lot of uh, audience feedback, which was valuable. Uh, can we just take it out into the area outside the room here and carry on the discussions? I think it'd be super cool. <laughs> yeah, no fist fights, please. <laughs>